Now, like, uh, I think there's nine different vehicles that you plan on offering. Are you going to offer essentially that level of re-sculpting on all of them or focus for, or is there only going to be maybe special carbon additions or certain parts on, on some of those vehicles going forward? I think this is, that's a good question. And I think like there, there's what we want to do and what we've kind of, that we are necessitated to do. You know, when we first started to go back to your original point, we first started, we thought we were going to be like a, a singer of electric vehicles, right? That we're going to have this impeccable detailed craftsmanship that we're going to build these perfect specimens of like what we, what we call internally, like high resolution versions of the classics that don't look good from like, you know, tiny little thumbnail pictures, but you can actually like put your face up against it that close and going, this shit does not, it is, it's incredible. Yeah. You know, and that is the car as we built, but here's the problem. Most of the market doesn't know the difference between your car and the one that is made of stamped crash parts. Cause in the end, here's a $300,000 car, a $250,000 car. They don't know or even care that it is the one or the other. So that's the first the kind of major difference is that the consumer doesn't seem to care too much which versions of that is because their priority is less on the impeccable craftsmanship and the quality. It's more about how quickly can I get it? Okay. So yeah, that's fair. So it's more like I'm willing to get by with stuff that maybe isn't as perfect if I can get that car in six months, but do I want to wait two years to have this perfect carbon fiber? I mean, you know, Singer is known to have like five and six year wait periods sometimes. You know, and that you get a lot of dropout with that. Sure. And then when people do get it, there's this expectation. It's there's an intolerance to anything that's not right about it. Um, so that that's kind of like I would say from a behavioral level, not a, not not anything we anticipated, but it makes perfect sense. And the other thing is like getting getting um, investor support or backing to do that. You know, Singer finally got backing after years of not of being solo. And we launched, we said, okay, we're going to do like, you know, a hundred of these cars and we had all the sales to go with it and all the, the tooling and everything set up to go. And investors are like, cool, I'm just going to buy a car, but I'm not going to help support it. So we got a lot of these like venture capital guys placing orders, but nobody wanted to back the industry. So then the idea we thought would be that we would get supported to grow that sort of high end business kind of like a, a, a Rimat or a Koenigsegg did, you know, getting their backing and it just never shows up. And, you know, what you find is like that, that is a business that could easily exist, but you have to be backed for it. There's no, there's no, uh, uh, cost effective way of producing. Uh, there's no cheap way to do expensive things, right? Not without backing, you know, like Apple didn't make one iPhone and go, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make a whole business out of this one phone. We're going to sell two of them and eight of them. And eventually over years, we'll recoup those cost efficiencies and build a, an, you know, uh, an Apple campus. They had the campus and the billions of dollars to make that possible. Sure. And I think that that's sort of what's misunderstood in our industry is you can't reinvest the profits to build, to build, work your way to cheaper. The cheaper comes from investment, you know? Tesla didn't reinvent its profits from the S's and the X to build uh, a big enough company to make the Model 3 possible. They took on shit tons of money to do that. Right. You know, and that's not understood in our industry, but it's true in every industry, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's very, like you mentioned with the stampings, it, and, and like a, a snapshot of my day, we decided, we, we, we went, we, I'll outline like, hey, if we were to change X, Y, and Z, there's this type of opportunity. And they're like, yeah. no problem okay, so we're going to need a new tool for this and we're going to need the ED and T for this and all this stuff. And you're like, okay, so this is going to be like $4 million to do this. We're like, yeah. And sometimes it'll tar out, right? You know, and you're like, okay, this is still positive for us. We're willing to do it. But you have to have essentially four, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in, a, in the bank when you look at this and you're like, well, what's coming across my desk today? Oh, this makes sense. Approve. And then that process starts, you know, so it's kind of interesting. Um, I mean, you learn a lot that investor support is not this sort of logical algorithm of like prove the market, you know, long term trajectory, barriers to entry, moats, willing customer base, all the stuff you think is true. It's not true. It's more it's very much like herd mentality. Like if someone else goes forward, then they'll go, we're all in on this. It doesn't matter. Like Richard Branson could endorse like, I don't know, like radioactive cookware, you know, like depleted uranium cookware, you know, but 
it, yeah, it'll kill you. But Branson's behind it, so we got to get into that. And, and on sure, that. sure. And that, that company would have no problem getting funding, even though it most definitely will kill you. Um, but something more logical that isn't backed like that is gonna never going to get started because then you realize you need that sort of prime mover um, – uh, the first law of Newtonian physics, you know, you need that first mover to make the ball roll. And that seems to be what a lot of venture capital is driven on. So, so as a business, we have all had to adapt to that and say, okay, we've got massive in the EV conversion space. We've all got this massive book of sales request list going for years on end, you know, zero laps has 70, I think we stopped counting at 77,500 order requests that are qualified like we're never going to be able to make that sure uh, without support and investors are like yeah great let us know when your first let them know when your lead investor shows up i'm like why can't that be you you know right, like right. we're not asking for oem money we're asking for for conversion money and that's a pennies on the dollar easier to do so now we're kind of like we in the industry overall are like what can we do with what we have cuz you know investors aren't showing up anytime soon and yet they're ready to go the minute that lead guy shows up and goes, I'm going to make this happen. We need our, we need our Richard Branson moment where somebody steps forward and going, I'm going to own this category. I'm going to make this happen. Right. Um, and, and until that happens, everyone's kind of look like waiting around. It's like a big row of penguins all lined up on the cliff with thousands of fish thrashing below, but they're all looking at each other going like, are you going to go first? I'm not going to go first. So you gonna go first. You know, they all want to make sure that we don't get eaten by a sea lion. But meanwhile, they're missing this beautiful feast right sure. below them. And and once the first one goes, the rest will jump in after. So this will become a multi-billion dollar industry after that moment. But because the, the market is there, the money is there, the category is there, the technology is there, the customers are trying to buy this. Right. And none of us can produce anything close to the demands we get against scale because we don't have the funding to address the scalable market. Okay. So... And do you think like the, do you think some of that has to do with maybe the vehicle offerings? Like, um, I'm trying to think like, uh, you know, you know, a Mustang in 1967 was like 2,500 bucks, right? You know, right. Um, and obviously that's not the case now. And, you know, automobiles from a price perspective have trended pretty well with inflation and all that stuff. They're expensive now, but um, I don't want to say so is everything, but they, they are unbelievably consistent. It's, I think they're, they're harding, they're, they're tracking extremely consistently and, and frankly, more so than most things. Um, I think just, just because of how efficient big auto is at essentially getting costs under control and cont and continually driving it down. Yeah. But, you know, same thing with the Broncos and, and like the Land Rovers, the, um, the Land Cruisers, like a lot of those were, uh, I guess for like, you know, your regular vehicle in the sixties. Um, do you think that maybe has something to do with it? Cause it's not necessarily, if we use Singer as an example, like a 911, that, that was always kind of a premium, a Porsche has always been a premium brand, you know, do you think that has something to do with essentially we're, we're taking, you know, it's relatively expensive to do essentially an EV conversion into, um, you know, some of these older vehicles and they themselves, you know, in their original condition are often kind of expensive themselves as well, you know? Right. Um, no, that's a good question. So I, I think what would be helpful is to sort of separate the, the, the parts, right? So, First of all, there's there's collector cars, which is what you're kind of addressing. Collector cars are really like asset class cars, cars that like sit in some guy's garage. It's beautiful. It works. You know, that thing is appreciated. And the stuff you kind of see at like a, a um, an auction or a Barrett Jackson or something like that. Uh, those, those are really not the aftermarket fix ups, but the original condition like that is a specimen that's perfect representation of that era. Right. Which means, you know, a, a restoration means like you don't have Bluetooth or um, heated seats or, you know, uh, three point seat belts. You know, you're rolling around on radials and white walls and lap belts. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a representation of how it would have been if that had existed. Anything beyond that that's not original is is a, is a resto mod. Right. I, I don't think it really matters whether it has a gas motor or a, a brand new Mustang V V8. You know, they didn't come with that motor. You're in resto mod territory, and and that's a that point is used to be much more debated than it is now. I think we all understand that. So the ones that are collector vehicles, that's kind of its own category, and I think that none of us in the in the the post market 
address those cars and say like, we're, no one's going to be convinced you're going to make an electric Land Rover and go, oh, but it's a collector car. It's not a collector car anymore. It's a different car. It's a usable car. Most cars in that, you know, in the hundred of millions, I think there's estimated to be about a hundred million classic vehicles in use right now. Most of them are not asset class vehicles. Some are, but it's a smaller number. It's like, I think it's estimated between like 5% of that number is, is truly collector classic, you know, the rest of them are just used. They're like rest of mod somewhere in between. And so within that, what do you do with that? Do you modernize it, make it usable for a daily driver, or do you try to bring it back to factory? And I think when you get into that category, electrification becomes inevitable because it is both increased usability, it's significantly better performance, and it reduces all the sort of stereotypes of why don't you want a classic car you know the answer to that right it breaks down it's loud it's shitty it's expensive i love the the tactile the tactility of it that's kind of everyone's argument but yeah the uh, the unreliability is the the reason that you're only driving that car by yourself and your family's not with you in that car sure you know or your wife refuses to get in it because she's going to end up smelling like she mowed the lawn you right. know <laughs> yeah. um and so, so that that's where we get into it. It's like, what is the best approach to keep these cars on the road from a usable perspective, right? Not not from a collector perspective, but from a usability perspective. And so then you get into the world of like where where nostalgia and technology and psychology all kind of intersect, right? And that's sort of the space of EV resto mods is you have this function of nostalgia, which is, you know, um, really that that we value the things that were that are part of our era as kind of an idea of self-identification it's sort of like in a weird way we defend it because it is representative of us you know if someone said we're just going to get rid of all music you're born in like let's say that like mp3s came along and, and like in, i think it was like 2003 or something like the 2002 and said all all MP3s before this, all music before this is going to be go away. We're only going to digitize new music. Sure. And at first people are like, yeah, that's great. Lossless, beautiful. And then we're not going to support anything past the MP3s. All that cassette record shit, we're going to throw it away and not support it. We're going to push everybody into buying new music and old music is gone. Well, that actually did happen. Like Apple did that and it was not good for Apple. Like people were pissed. Because like, what do you mean I can't listen to my old music on MP3? What do you mean you don't support it? What do you mean it can't be digital? Like, no, 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 let's focus on the new music. Yeah, Led Zeppelin's still That's, as good as it was in the 60s, you know, in 70s. Exactly. So, <laughs> unlike and, the, and so the cars. That very thing is exactly what's happening in automotive right now. You know, you have, you have this change in technology that is superior in every way to what preceded it. It's better quality. It's much better experience. It's better performing. Uh, more or less, it's lossless, you know. Your, your, your first drive is as good a quality as your 25th drive or your 100th drive. Um, and and that, that said, there's a line being drawn of what do you do with our past? And the answer is focus on new cars. Let it go. Maybe, maybe we'll rebrand. We'll bring back what Revival brand. We'll bring back the Defender again. We'll bring back the Bronco again. We'll bring back a new version of the Mustang. But that's not really the same. Right. That's not your Mustang, you know? And so... So the opportunity is is to digitize the past, to say, let's bring those MP3s, let's bring those old songs and, and digitize them. Let's let's remaster the original Tron or the original Star Wars or something. And so you can watch it in the future. Right. And you know, not everything's gonna survive. Um, but the important ones will. Now that that's the market opportunity. And and so then you get into the psychology of well, why do that? What what is the point of that, right? It's because that's you. That's your era. You know, that is your music. That is your brand. That is your cars. Psychology very often misunderstands the function of nostalgia. When you really look at what nostalgia is, it's not this like longing for the old days like people think it is. What nostalgia is, is it has a neuroprotective function. When we get overwhelmed or depressed or unsure of ourselves, we cling to things that we stuck to in the past, right? I was a skateboarder in the past. I endlessly watch skateboard videos. You know, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm talking to my friends on, uh, on like, you know, Instagram, there's a 99% chance we're sending each other skateboard videos. Sure. You know, even though I haven't skated in probably 15 years, 
it's still part of my past, you know, and I still talk to agency people every day. And that's part of my past too. So we keep those things around because it's who we are. So there's a, there's an urgency now in the market. Like, what are we going to do with these old cars? That's my car. It's my era. I don't want to go buy a Tesla. That's, that's a, 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 a meaningless piece of shit to me. It's like, it's, it drives great, but it has no meaning. It has no soul. I want what I want, but what I want doesn't really work in the future. Gotcha. And so that's the big aha moment. We get to, you get to keep what's important to you in the past, but you get to express it in a way that is compatible with the future. You know, that's the, that's the potential of the category, which is why it's going to be a multi-billion dollar category. When people put those two together at scale, holy shit, you know, 